OIPC is excited to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Jennifer Grenz, to the stage. Um, so Dr. Grenz is a researcher and Indigenous scholar who currently works in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia. She's worked professionally in invasive species management for almost two decades and recently completed her PhD, which focused on applying an Indigenous worldview to invasion biology and ecology. Uh, so Dr. Grenz, uh, please join me on the stage by turning on your camera and mic, and everyone can give a big round of applause to welcome <laughs> Dr. Grenz. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, we're farmers, so we've been up for a long time. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you so much for, for having me. And I'm just going to um, have that funny, awkward moment where I share my screen. Oops, one second. Hey, awesome. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, I'm joining you this morning um, from the lands of the Pentledge speaking people, which is also known now as Parksville, British Columbia on Vancouver Island. So uh, I commute back and forth uh, to UBC. <clears throat> and um, I'm just so glad to be able to share uh, with you sort of my personal journey uh, that led to uh, my research. Um, and I'm actually, I have a, a new appointment at UBC as of yesterday, so I'm actually now uh, in the Department of Forest Resource Management uh, in the Faculty of Forestry, where I'm also jointly, appoint, uh, jointly appointed with the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. And if you want to find me uh, after this talk, uh, you can um, email me there and my Twitter handle there as well, uh, is there as well, and I'm quite active on that. All right, so. Um, this morning, I'm going to teach you uh, the Indigenous way, and that is by, uh, by way of a story, uh, my story, which is a strangely personalized approach to science, right? And while the primary objective of my presence uh, with you today is to provide you with an overview of my research that I've been doing, and I, I will do that, I have an ulterior motive. Um, I want you to leave here today having your curiosity piqued about what an Indigenous worldview is and what it can offer complicated fields of scientific study. Um, this story is about the application of what I call uh, relational science as an act of reconciliation between the two worlds that I walk in. So that's Jen the Indigenous woman and Jen the scientist. And I'm going to warn you um, that what I'm about to share with you might make you a little bit uncomfortable and not because the content of my presentation is explicit or inappropriate in any way, um, but because some scientists may consider my methodology sacrilege um, and because some folks aren't comfortable with talking about the impacts of colonialism. But you see, the impacts of colonialism um, run deep. Uh, so deep that they even have an impact on topics that you are familiar with, like plant science, invasion biology, and ecology. So this is all about a fundamental shift in the philosophy of ecology, um, leading to what I hope is ecological reconciliation. Um, so a little bit about me, I do have some Ontario colleagues. Uh, hello to those of you that um, I know, but uh, uh, for those that don't, just a little bit about um, who I am because it is integral um, to how my research came to be. Um, I definitely have not taken a typical path to academia. Um, I've had um, more than decade, well, almost two decade long career, um, I, but I did have a decade long gap before I actually returned to graduate school. And I have had the best jobs ever uh, working on invasive species management. Um, I have worked on a number of species, aquatic and terrestrial. I've been on the front lines of EDRR species and somehow became an expert on knotweed and their seed ecophysiology. And I've spent a lot of time developing best management practices uh, for British Columbia, uh, as well as guiding and writing uh, government policy. Um, I also run a company, and I still do, uh, that does contract work for various levels of government, conducting treatment trials, uh, control work on a landscape level, um, as well as completing land healing initiatives. And we focus on hiring women interested in careers in STEM as well as Indigenous people. 
And I am also sent into areas with very sensitive ecosystems where there may be new species um, or where there is um, significant public opposition to herbicide use um, or where quick research is needed. Um, and then now um, I have been a sessional lecturer at UBC teaching weed science uh, and principles and practices of community food security for the last few years. Um, but now I'm shifting into a new role at UBC and I've also been working as a policy researcher for reconciliation policy for fisheries and oceans Canada. So to sum it up, I'm all about the plants uh, and the planet. And then there's this other side of myself quietly at home. I've practiced my culture uh, in fulfilling my role as a medicine woman. I am a proud and Hammock woman. My family is from the Lytton first nation. And perhaps you've caught you um, well, you couldn't miss um, on the news this year what happened uh, to my traditional territory um, during the heat dome this summer. And so, you know, my family is living the climate emergency. Um, and this just makes the work that I'm doing feel that much more um, important and, and I feel more dedicated to the, my, to the cause. Um, but I am actually known as one of the coastal cousins having grown up in the coast of BC. Um, and uh, my life is working on plants all the time. So in research, work, at home, collecting plants for food, social and ceremonial purposes um, and fulfilling that role as a medicine woman. And this is a part of myself that I did not share uh, with many people, um, you know, outside of my community um, or outside of my family. And that was really an act of self protection, um, you know, because there are cosmologies associated with indigeneity that, you know, people in science may not be comfortable with. Um, you know, I've had mentors tell me enough with the indigenous stuff. Um, you know, it might undermine you as a scientist, um, you know, and so those are the kind and that wasn't out of, um, you know, that wasn't cruel or, or mean. It was, you know, it was just out of looking out for me uh, in, in some respects. Right. Um, but after two decades of keeping those two worlds apart and seeing seeing failures and many of the restoration projects that I worked on. I really found myself questioning the reasoning behind some of these sort of seemingly pointless projects. Um, that we were working on that we really knew from the outset were doomed to fail. And I, I'm guessing there are some of you in this audience that have at least had these, you know, your inner monologue, perhaps say some of these words as well. Um, and so for the first time, I finally allowed myself to see my work um, from an Indigenous worldview. So my worlds kind of collided and actually this is the exact spot <laughs> where it happened. Um, I knew that I couldn't continue working in the way um, that I had and that our worldview actually had something to offer uh, invasive species management and ecological restoration and I felt empowered to give it my voice. And so I shifted my focus um, and, you know, it just became clear to me that invasion biology and restoration ecology had something to gain um, from an Indigenous worldview at a time when we certainly needed um, other other views. It always bothered me that, you know, these restoration projects that we worked on also didn't have a specific purpose. So what were we trying to do and why? Um, it seemed as though we were acting as mechanics of the forest. So kind of like fixers, um, you know, fixing to some sort of aesthetic notion of what these systems look like or attempts to put things back uh, to some random version of what we would call naturalness. Um, and this is something I continue to deal with in my work now, and it can be completely foreign to those in this line of work to consider things like traditional food systems, um, you know, as an example. And some of this has to do with, you know, a, a new environmental culture that I call live and let live. Um, you know, we've done such a great job with advocacy and environmental awareness, um, but we may now have gotten to a point where we've lost practicality. Um, you know, we have overcompensation and this could be a tragedy of our messaging. It's something that I'm actually studying right now. Uh, you know, environmentalism in some respects has forgotten humans. So we don't recognize that humans have shaped the ecosystem for thousands of years and that what we see on the landscape today is a legacy of that. It's not natural. Um, th this is a colonial concept of, of naturalness. 
And we need to spend some time thinking about this. You know, our climate is changing. We're spending a lot of money fighting invasive species. We're not always seeing good returns on those investments. Um, you know, and we have found that food value in some species. Um, you know, pollinators that are struggling seem to be adapting as well. <clears throat> And I really do believe that change is needed in our field of study. Um, I think that we've been inhibited by the lack of reception to other viewpoints. Um, advocacy being a major component um, in our field has polluted the field. Um, you know, we use a lot of hyperbole and generalized principles of plant physiology and generalized impacts. Um, and there are reasons for that, right? We have this advocacy component that we deal with where we have to convince government agencies to continue to give us funding, um, you know, to create public awareness, to break through all of the other noise. So there are reasons for it, but we may then be compromising the science, <clears throat> you know, in, in that. Now, this doesn't mean um, that all of us, including indigenous communities and indigenous people aren't concerned about invasive species. So I don't wanna sound like I'm undermining our field of study. That is not the case at all. Um, you know, we are very concerned about the the impacts of invasive species, um, you know, and indigenous communities in particular have a lot at stake. And while we're obviously concerned about those impacts, um, you know, indigenous communities uh, are often more vulnerable. Um, you know, there are issues such as food security and food sovereignty um, that need to be addressed. Um, you know, and one of the things that I've found in working with many indigenous communities over the years is that there is this sort of caution in terms of taking action. And I'm going to get back to that, uh, the wisdom of that um, in a moment. Um, the thing that we have to recognize is often we actually don't know the specific impacts um, of specific species of, of invasive plants. And, and if you go through literature, um, you know, you're hard pressed to actually find those. Um, and, and so it is important that we kind of get back into the science to examine those impacts. And one of the examples is that we actually don't know the specific impacts on our traditionally important plants um, for indigenous communities. And looking ahead at climate change, you know, we have to ask ourselves the question, is our ability to adapt at risk, um, you know, due to current methods of plant risk assessment or a purist approach to restoration, um, you know, where our our concepts are based on or our restoration is guided by a belongingness. So this belongs or that doesn't belong. And as Indigenous people, you know, adaptation is who we are. Um, we have lived through in on our lands changes in speciation. Um, and one of the things that I found in the beginning of my research journey was that Indigenous perspectives on invasive species are largely unknown um, other than on Australia. Um, where uh, Trigger, who did the research there, actually found a significant epistemic openness um, to, you know, new arrivals. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this book. Um, my colleagues in Alberta uh, actually sort of challenged uh, everyone to read it. If you haven't, I highly suggest it. <clears throat> and I've just got this here because, you know, regardless of the need for this work, um, you know, it's an uphill battle to be able to examine invasive species from an alternative perspective. Um, you know, I think that uh, we're a really fun bun bunch or us weed folk, um, but we have a bit of a reputation for not being kind uh, to alternative perspectives. And I think that's something we can all kind of chuckle about. I've certainly been part of that. Um, you know, and and this is actually why I had a lot of hesitancy about actually kind of bringing these two worlds together um, that, you know, I got very tired um, and wanted to see better results with what we've been working on and self protection is exhausting um, and trying to quiet that little voice in the back of your head, you know, after a while also gets exhausting um, and, you know, it is okay for us to question um, question our work. Um, but, you know, by and large, we are not a field of study that is particularly welcoming uh, to alternative perspectives. So we need 
another worldview that will provide us the freedom to actually be able to look at these issues differently in spite of perhaps a professional culture that has discouraged it. Um, you know, so I want you to play along with me here. I'm sure you're familiar with these sorts of images um, where it's, you know, what do you see, right? And there are a couple of different things that you can see. So I'm just going to run through um, these slides. Okay, so what you saw was neither right or wrong, um, and there's going to be a lot going on um, that's informing what you saw or what you didn't see. Um, and, you know, this image right here, you could say it's like a donkey head or a seal. Um, and one of the things that can happen in these sorts of images is sometimes we can't see one of the things. But once you've been told what that thing is, then you can actually shift your vision um, to be able to see one and then the other and back and forth and back and forth again. Um, and for me, this is the most tangible example of what we're going to do together during this presentation. So I want you to be able to see things perhaps that you didn't see before um, to see as I do and be able to flip that back and forth. So the Indigenous worldview may be a possible solution, you know, to presenting another worldview to invasive species and, its man and their management. Um, it's a possible solution as people have begun to seek Indigenous knowledge um, and they're thus likely uh, less, uh, less likely, sorry, to reject it, um, you know, and Though it's become kind of, I would say, fashionable to integrate Indigenous knowledge, um, you know, this is not that. Uh, I actually often argue that simple integration is actually damaging to our communities. Um, it is to take our knowledge and pull it out of context um, because more, uh, most people don't realize that we actually see the world quite differently. So it's not just about our knowledges, it's actually about how we see. And here's an important difference. So Chief Dan George of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation um, offered this wisdom when he spoke about integration of Indigenous children into the public school system. And I think it speaks to the integration of Indigenous knowledge in any colonial structure. He said, can we talk of integration until there's integration of hearts and minds? Unless you do this, you have only a physical presence and the walls between us are as high as the mountain range. And so this is, you know, if you don't know the headwaters of our knowledge, where it's coming from, um, you know, this leaves our knowledge vulnerable to fragmentation, to misuse, to misunderstanding. Um, so it is critical that if you're engaging, you know, in the use of Indigenous knowledge that you understand the power um, of the worldview and the source of that information. So what is an Indigenous worldview? Um, I need to explain our relational worldview so you'll understand even our Indigenous research methodology. So I want you to imagine like you're putting on glasses and you are seeing the world as a web of connections that span both space and time. We are not outside the environment, but equally a part of it. And you see connections rather than things. So your connection to the earth, your connection to each other, to the bees, to the food that you eat, to your garden, to your grandmother, to your great grandmother. And I challenge um, people to go to a place that you are very familiar with, even your own garden, your yard, a park that you visit somewhere where you work. And instead of looking at the things start to look at the connections. And one of the things that you'll find, and I think this is something that happens to those of us that work in invasive species management a lot, is we look for our target and we fixate on the target, um, you know, because our mission is to get rid of it. And we forget to look at the connections. And so I actually did this exercise 
myself this summer going to some of the sites where I've been doing treatments for between four and eight years um, and, you know, suddenly was noticing things there that I had never seen before. And I know these sites like the back of my hand, but it just showed me that we have to um, force ourselves or challenge ourselves to really see the connections of everything that's around us. Our worldview is rooted in the nature of our verb-based languages. So shifting from English, English is a noun-based language that objectifies most things. So like that tree, that rock, that mountain, our verb-based languages um, are transformative. Um, that isn't a tree, it's treeing. That isn't a bay, it's baying. That isn't a mountain, it's mountaining. So do you feel how that changes the world around you? So we're into animacy now, right? You are in relation with all of these things around you, um, not things, living, um, you know, beings. Um, you know, and again, this worldview, this, is the headwaters from where our knowledge flows. So our knowledge is not held to the past. You know, we're not just simply, you know, sharing history. And we actually can then look at things now and provide really valuable contributions. So our knowledge in the past is important, but also using this relational um, worldview helps us to have insights about how we move forward. Robin Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass provided an example of our relational worldview with an ecosystem inquiry um, by presenting the differences between the questions asked by Western scientists versus Indigenous peoples. Um, so while she was doing her undergraduate degree, she found that when encountering a plant that they didn't know, the question scientists raised were not, who are you, but what is it? No one asked the plants, what can you tell us? The primary question was, how does it work? Um, the research subjects are reduced to an object. And so I take this in my work a step further and ask, what is your story? So for my research journey, it really can be summarized um, like this. Um, so when I was telling an elder in Couch and Tribes, Peter Williams, about my project, he said to me, the greatest distance a man must travel is that between his head and his heart. And so for me, my research journey has been exactly that. It is a connection between my Western, you know, scientific trained head and my indigenous heart. But, you know, embracing um, the indigenous worldview and using indigenous research methodology, um, you know, which is founded in that worldview is uh, easier said than done when you're a Western trained scientist. Um, you know, and while it's grounded in relationality and respect and reciprocity, um, you know, I really was struggling um, to figure out how to be on the land and ask different questions and look at things differently, you know, because we become very automatic in our work, right? We can do assessments on a landscape level very quickly, um, you know, if that is our line of work. Um, and so I was expressing actually my frustration um, with this uh, to Peter Cole, who's a, an indigenous professor in education at UBC. And he actually wrote me back uh, this poem. He said, write in your own way, think in your own way, research in your own way. Don't think you have to ask permission. How long does it have to go on for? Quote your elders, your children, the wind, the waves, the clouds. They are always telling you stories, listening to your stories. Um, and this was critical for me. Um, because it was a, it was permission. And this is what I, you know, I'm trying to stress to even, you know, my non-Indigenous colleagues is we have to give ourselves permission to work outside of the confines of Western science, of how we've been taught to think and to, to look at things. And I could spend an entire session teaching you about Indigenous research methodology, but the fundamentals are that it's based on respect, relationality, and reciprocity. So we are actually in relation with what we're studying and we're accountable to those relations and it puts us inside the research. So we say goodbye to objectivity 
Um, and then we begin multiple ceremonies, and that might be what you would call data collection, um, working relationally to address our research objectives, and you know, um, treating that data collection as ceremony really changes uh, your perspective on what it is that you're taking in and how you're going about um, working. And one of the things that's wonderful is that the communities that you're working with are actually your co-researchers. Um, so you're working together to, to create the questions, how you're looking at things, and then how you're actually assessing and analyzing uh, what has come out of those ceremonies. Um, and it really is so different in that there's such a focus on the connections between the different things. So you may have a project with multiple objectives and suddenly they're all woven together um, in a much more tangible way. Okay, sorry, I just wanna check my time here. Okay, we're doing great. <laughs> so <laughs> what do indigenous knowledge holders think about invasive species? Um, so embracing that methodology, you know, I came back to my field of study and asked exactly this. And it would be much easier, uh, near tidier to say that the end of my research journey, I could provide you a definitive answer to this question. Um, and the spoiler is there isn't one. Um, this was the grand lesson of this entire research ceremony for me. There is no one answer. And what I encountered instead was a series of answers found at various places along the middle of what I call the philosophy of invasive species spectrum, where, you know, at one end we have uh, live and let live, and at the other end we have kill anything that doesn't belong, okay? And what was also interesting um, in all of these answers is that the answers were not static. Um, like the nature of our Indigenous stories, they uh, can adapt and change depending on the context. And so there was a beautiful and reflective fluidity um, to the answers to these questions. And it was a vast departure from the familiarity of our foundation of rigid dichotomies. Um, so we had found our Indigenous ecology. And so this was, you know, one example. Um, so this is um, Elder Luce Cheem from Couch and Tribes, Dr. Arvid Charlie. Um, and, uh, you know, he told us a story about Scotch Broom and that um, there were um, people in Couch and Tribes that had been working in berry fields and whatever they had been spraying on the crops was giving people burns and rashes on their hands. And his aunt had come home and his um, grandfather sent Luschim out to go and collect some scotch broom plants and he boiled them and he put um, you know what they the, what they had made on his aunt's burns and her skin healed and it was one of the I think it was the first time at least for me um, and and the lands manager at Couch and Tribes that we had ever heard of a positive story about scotch broom um, you know, the, on Vancouver Island, this is like, you know, everyone knows about scotch broom and hates it, um, you know, and, but, and then, and, you know, the next five minutes, um, Luce Chain is telling us a story about how scotch broom has displaced a very important medicine um, at another site. And, you know, and so I think that this is something that we have to start to examine and think about that maybe we need to become a little bit more context specific um, about our efforts and also give some consideration, um, you know, to species that don't show up in our risk assessments. So, um, you know, when I say an indigenous ecology that's, that's based on this, the definition that we created was a relationally guided healing of our lands, waters, and relations, which bring us a desired balance to an ecosystem while respecting and honoring our mutual dependence through reciprocity. Um, and so, you know, a modern, it's important to understand that modern ecology um, rests upon um, what I call an Eden foundation. So one of returning something back to a perceived natural state. Um, and instead what we found, and which I believe was not a discovery, but like how we find many of our artifacts, we found ecology as it was always intended, intended, intended sorry, upon a relational foundation. 
Um, you know, so instead of, you know, humans um, causing the fall of the ecosystem, um, you know, humans are inside it and have a role to play uh, in terms of maintaining balance. And when I say balance, I don't mean a static balance. I mean a dynamic balance that adjusts to the needs of community, the values of community, a changing climate. And so fundamental to an indigenous ecology is that humans actually act as the balancer of the ecosystem. So we're not fixers of an Eden ecology. Um, this is about making very difficult decisions about a desired balance and accepting the responsibility that comes with that leadership role in the ecosystem. So we can't be left out of the ecosystem like a chef to a pot of soup. Like that's kind of how I see how we end up um, acting, right? We're like looking into this pot, throwing a few things in, taking things out, seeing what's going on. We have to recognize we are in the soup, right? We are in it. So we have to talk about what are our values? What's the flavor? What if the soup is bad? You know, um, we don't get to walk away. Uh, we solve, um, you know, we, we tend to solve things in ecological restoration and a short-term commitment. But if we're in the pot, we have to be committed to what happens over time, uh, you know, in, in that pot. Um, and so this is consistent with our Indigenous worldview. Our stories can change, the balance can change, the flavors can change. And part of that is acknowledging the history of the land. So this is looking down into one of my research sites, which is called Yum Nuts, which is a, an ancestral site of Cowichan people. Acknowledging the history of land, the true history of the land. Um, you know, so many projects I've worked on, no one asks what was the story of this place before I got here and am supposed to fix it, right? You know, why is it like how it is right now? It's important to understand that when you look at a landscape, you may call it natural or wilderness, but to do that is to dismiss the intimate relationship of Indigenous people and land. Uh, indigenous ecology recognizes the reality of what we see today is often not natural. Um, there's a recognition that what settlers see as a natural state is in fact a legacy of the past. Um, a lot of work went into shaping systems um, to provide food and technology, uh, you know, for very large communities, um, you know, and so, so that is a really important thing to recognize. And as an example here, we have a Gary Oak ecosystem. This is an ecosystem that requires human intervention to exist. Otherwise, here in BC, um, we will have coniferous uh, forest and close the canopy. Um, and fire was a big part of maintaining what were actually, this was the land of our bulb farms. So we were, you know, the first farmers uh, in many respects. So in my primary research site, when I first arrived, and this is near Duncan, uh, British Columbia, um, it was a sea of weeds. I could have taught the weed science course at UBC standing still, um, you know, and, um, and what I realized that the soil was in fact a knowledge keeper and a storyteller um, for the first time. So instead of just being like, we need to get rid of all this Canada thistle, we need to get rid of all this Himalayan blackberry. It was like, what is the soil telling us? What is the story of this place? How did it get um, you know, to, to how it is now? And the soil told the story of Yamna. So there was a village there 3,000 years previous. These are my friends working on some of the archaeology on site. And it tells the story of what people were eating. It tells how they cooked it, of the tools that they used, of distant travels. Um, you know, there were tools made from chert that came from Oregon. Um, you know, this was my first opportunity to work on a land healing project um, that was an archaeology site, which really also shifted my perspective. And, you know, I reflected one day, I sat frustrated because we were trying to figure out, we, we had tried planting some plants, um, you know, native species and they died and nothing was doing well. And I felt super frustrated and I sat down in the soil and I actually scraped my fingernails into the soil and I brought them to my face and I said, you know, what are you trying to tell me? What am I missing? Uh, you know, what do you want to be? 
And I think it's, you know, this dichotomously guided restoration, um, you know, this fixation on belongingness in our ecosystem is just not working. You know, belongingness has become the decision-making framework of modern day ecological restoration. This what should and shouldn't be their approach, um, you know, can also be viewed as doing restoration at a, at a fixed point in time, right? Uh, what we've hit a pause button on the ecosystem. And, you know, this does not reflect an epistemic openness uh, necessarily to other species as we experience a changing climate. So as I looked at my soil beneath my fingernails, I tried to imagine the story over time. And then I let my imagination go. And suddenly I heard mooing. The gentle mooing of dairy cows that lived among these very Gary Oaks for almost a hundred years. Of course, the dichotomously led, you know, restoration wasn't working. We couldn't put things back to how the Gary Oak eco ecosystem should be. This isn't the same soil. The story of the soil was that it was a dairy farm after the settlers arrived. These were actually what we call anthropogenic soils. So look up soils of Gary Oak ecosystems versus dairy. Uh, you know, we needed a new plan, right? Our indigenous ecology made it clear that we needed to ask, what do we want the story of this place to be in the future? And what can it be by honoring the stories that got it to the place that it is now? So instead of putting it back to what we believe a Gary Oak ecosystem should be, um, you know, it was this, it was that the site should be a cultural reclamation site that we should create a place for children to learn about food production, traditional foods or not to take advantage of what the site had, what the story had led us to, which is this highly fertile soil for growing things and create something that not only would physically feed the community, but spiritually feed the community as well. And a dichotomously guided ecological restoration would never have given us this. We would never have heard or considered the stories of the soil. We would have continued to experience a lack of success. And we wouldn't have created something that brought so much engagement from kids and community members. So we took advantage of the deep nutrient rich soils that were loved by Canada, that were wet enough for reed canary grass to make, you know, to make, make their home there as well. And I think what's also important to point out, so this is um, uphill from my research site. And uh, you can see here the human um, component of managing systems that's often forgotten, right? We also do this, what I call MIC restoration, where we come in, we take things out, we plant things and leave, right? Um, but this is an example where, you know, we have to create human relationship with these spaces. So if we're not reliant upon them for food, then we have to find other ways to maintain that relationship. So this is an example um, in the Gary Oak system that used to require fire to keep them open. You can see um, this is a trial site where there was mowing done. So uh, on the left, the Gary Oaks are open and on the right, Snowberry is actually crowding out new Gary Oaks from growing um, and creating a solid, um, you know, impenetrable thicket. Um, and this was just a, a great example that, you know, the land actually needs us. Uh, needs the people. We are essential um, to its function. We are part of the ecological function. And so, you know, as I'm wrapping up here, sorry, I'm just going to check my time again. Um, you know, it's okay for us to reimagine what systems look like. We don't have to fight the story of the past, right? We have to honor it and work with it and then be purposeful in creating a story to go forward. It's not automatic. What this site would have become um, had we not chosen it for um, our research site for this project was that they had planned, they were just going to plant a bunch of camas bulbs um, and, you know, and clear the weeds out. This was actually one of the, um, one of the, reed canary grass control attempts that happened here um, and that would have been it there would have been really no human engagement which was desired by um, couch and tribes because it's actually the site backs onto 
a school where many of their children go. Um, so there's significant cultural opportunity. Uh, and, you know, it would have failed anyways, and it would have ended up looking like a seed of weeds. And so embracing the fact that we are balancers, we are not fixers, um, you know, and this is underway now is creating, and we worked with the University of Victoria um, with some graduate students there to create education about the ancestral site, and then to begin writing a story, um, you know, for how we move forward. Um, and so, and this is something I really encourage you to do because you know, as we are shapers of the ecosystem. So we can't just have this dichotomously guided restoration. Write a story, and this is what I actually learned from one of my children that I brought on site because he actually started telling me like, oh, you know, there could be a site over there for the kids to harvest vegetables. And there could be a site over here to learn about traditional plants. And there could be a site over here for drumming. And there could be a site, right? And so he started to create kind of a story for what this place would look like. And suddenly I found that we were actually meeting the needs and values of the community, which was to have cultural reclamation, to improve food security, to learn also about traditional plants. But the fact that we were growing other fruits and carrots, you know, doesn't make it not a, a native landscape, right? We, we have to realize that you know, we need to honor the story of the past and create a story that makes sense going forward and be purposeful about what it is that that contains and that it had better in some way find a way for there to be human engagement to fulfill that role. Because I can tell you that so many of these MIC restoration projects I've been part of, you know, you go back the next year and there's a sea of weeds again. So, you know, I'm in the business now of trying to stop chasing our tails. And so, you know, our work has to meet the needs of community. We have to work by community values um, and be purposeful in deciding, you know, what the stories of these places are, but then also recognizing that we have to honor again, those stories of the past, because so this is another Gary Oak site um, that had not been a dairy farm for a hundred years where the kind of restoration that they were originally looking for on my research site, um, you know, this area, it was possible to plant these camas meadows and have successful um, because there was not that story of the soil of a hundred years of settlers raising dairy cows on it. And I just wanna show you as I'm wrapping up here, you know, a couple of examples of how how this, you know, different way of working and thinking has uh, had an impact on some of the work that I'm doing. So one of the invasive plants that often gets targeted now for control work um, on the island is sweet fennel. Um, and uh, this is Diane Hinckley, uh, the lands research director for Couch and Tribes and just an amazing human being, um, you know, and we went, this is actually, if you look where she's standing, you can see all the broken shells at her feet. Um, so this was actually um, a midden uh, where um, clams, there were clam gardens here, and then clams were processed and dried uh, on this site. That's why all these shells are, are there. So it's an important um, site where we actually have to make sure that we're not using um, you know, control methods of plants uh, where we're disrupting archeo important archaeology. So protection of archaeology is actually what brought us to this site because the sweet fennel was being pulled and the middens were being um, disrupted. And when we were there, Diane said, well, the elders actually really like this plant, <laughs> uh, you know, because it's useful for food and there are other properties of the plant, um, you know, that, that are useful. And so we actually determined that this site would be left. Um, and again, because humans aren't walking away and letting nature do its thing, but are part of it, that the people who manage this particular property um, were going to contain the species 
um, to this area for harvest purposes and to protect the archaeology. Um, and, you know, this run flies in the face of the priorities, uh, you know, of the invasive plant management program that wants to control this plant completely on the island, um, which is not necessarily realistic. And so, you know, I just think this is where we have to start to be okay and purposeful with the decisions, but also ask ourselves, you know, what do these species offer? You know, as we have a changing climate, one of the things that I asked um, loose cheam in particular, you know, and something that concerns me as a plant medicine woman is how do we find new plants? How do we find new medicines? How, you know, like as we are, you know, we're watching on Vancouver Island right now, Western red cedar, which actually could have been considered an invasive species 5,000 years ago, um, is starting to die. You know, how are we giving consideration, um, you know, to these species? Another project that I've been working on, um, you know, is uh, on the north side of Couch and Lake where the Roosevelt elk are, um, and it's an invasive um, grass species, downy false brome, and we've started to look at the, and understand the grass better by looking at what the elk are doing and understanding the relationship between the elk um, and the grasses, something I would never have done before, but has helped us to find more of the species um, and understand more about its seed ecophysiology um, and also uh, helping to, you know, alter our control um, strategies. It's not enough for us to accomplish eradication. Again, having this story going forward, um, you know, what comes next? What do we need from this place? Um, you know, these kinds of pictures are very satisfying, but we have to ask, you know, then what do our animal fish insect relations also need from this space? Um, because, you know, sometimes our projects end up like this, which is the succession of invasive species where, you know, one action in this case in BC parks, getting rid of Himalayan blackberry gave rise to an invasive and patient species. And so just to wrap up, you know, we have to change our language about how we describe what it is that we're doing. We have to move away from, you know, transactional, um, impersonal terminology to ones that reflect that, you know, um, animacy, right? And, and, and think about, you know, how we bring this in. We, we, we have to get away from the terminology that we have. So I don't actually use the term ecological restoration anymore. I use land and water healing because healing is multidimensional, right? We're not just talking about healing the land. We're talking about healing communities, healing people, you know, natural areas to legacy areas so that we honor the shaping, the purposeful shaping of lands by Indigenous people. Moving away from things like native and non-native species to what I describe as relationally preferred species. So what do we want in this space? What, what is part of this story going forward? Instead of things like species assessment, species consideration. If you're assessing something, you're coming at it with a totally different energy than if you're giving it consideration. And that is something that I really learned from elders when we were talking about invasive species and what they thought about them. You know, from land management to land balancing, these are all just examples. And this is, you know, something new and something that we're building. But I challenge you also, you know, in your own work, you know, how can I change the terminology that I'm using to create an opportunity for me to use a more relational approach? And so just, you know, what is the desired balance, dynamic balance of this place? What are the stories? What values? What's the current story? How are the relations of this place doing? What connects us to this place? You know, what do we want the story of this place to be uh, moving forwards? And so in coming full circle, you know, there's science in our stories and our relational worldview allows us to look at complicated fields like invasion biology and ecological restoration from a vantage point that allows us to be in relation with the very problems that we're trying to solve. So from this vantage point, we see that land healing is about values. When we are free to acknowledge and tend to our values, we also remember and keep at the forefront why it is that we're doing what we're doing. Um, and, you know, the application of a different worldview isn't scary. Um, it doesn't undermine the integrity of the work that we do from other vantage points. You know, I study weed science. I study specifically seed ecophysiology using Western science. Um, and it's not undermining that work. In fact, our project showed us this. So, you know, 
we have to um, we have to just give ourselves the freedom to be able to complete the picture. And that's what the slide is all about, is that it's not about one worldview or the other being right or bringing them together so that neither stand on their own anymore. It's just about completing the picture, seeing things that we couldn't see on the land before because we were coming at it like, there's the target and I'm gonna get it, right? You know, so, so I just really encourage you, and this isn't just something you know, applying an Indigenous worldview, a relational worldview is not just for Indigenous people. Um, you know, should you be engaging with Indigenous communities if you're using Indigenous research methodology? Absolutely, you should. But nothing stops you from starting to practice that relational worldview of what you're working on and challenging yourself to work differently, to see things differently and come up with, you know, multi-dimensional healing for, of our lands. Um, you know, that serves many purposes, um, not just, you know, does it belong or not belong. And so I challenge all of you, you know, to what I say, make the old new again uh, in your work. Challenge yourselves to have the freedom to have your work guided by those three R's of respect, relationality, and reciprocity, and just see what changes. Um, so thank you so much uh, for having